I want to welcome you to our meeting this morning. I pray that you are encouraged by our message. I don't know exactly what you went through. I don't know exactly what you're going to go through. But one thing is for sure, is that God is there in the midst of our crazy lives. And as we uh, have entered the year 2021, the year 2020 was difficult. It was just unprecedented having a virus that affected our world this 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 deeply and 2021 um, has, hasn't really changed right but the one thing that we can always count on is God's faithfulness so as um, we as a church gather together online like today I want to encourage you to uh, message our Facebook page or get in contact with me personally to share your prayer request, to share uh, what you may be struggling with. And I pray that we can support you as you journey through this hectic world that we live in. Many of you have asked, um, how can I give to uh, the church? On a Sabbath like today, we're not meeting in person we're meeting online via youtube and facebook so people have asked how can i give when i am not able to be at the building you can join uh giving to our church with the adventist giving app found on both ios and the google play store you can also google adventist giving and you're going to be able to find a way that you can give to your church online without uh, mailing a check or so forth. At a click of a button, you can give to your local church. I pray that uh, you are encouraged uh, through uh, this message that we're about to hear. But right before uh, the message, there's going to be a song. And uh, before the song, I want to have prayer. I pray that this message can give you hope in the midst of a very anxious world. And I pray that you are encouraged because Jesus is coming very soon. But till then, may we as a church gather together because we're stronger together than when we are apart. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you can bless our time together this morning. We pray, Lord, that you bless the speaker, you bless the hearer, and that we can, we can follow you because you gave your life for us. May we give our life to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all.
Good morning. This is Rob Irwin, and I am uh, coming to you by a pre-recorded sermon using uh, video recording. But I'm very glad to be able to share this message with you there in Lockport this morning on February 6. I enjoy uh, meeting with you all and seeing you in person, but it's not possible to do that in this particular uh, venue or this particular um, date. <clears throat> so anyway, greetings to you. I wish I could be there in person and I'm sure I can see you again sometime in person. So I wanna share with you today uh, a sermon that has been very helpful to me in my own spiritual walk. And it's a sermon that I developed having read uh, some texts that really prompted me to think about this issue. And I've also thought about it in, you know, in other, other times in my life. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see um, what I'm thinking of here. So um, here's my question. Can I experience closeness with God? You know, sometimes we uh, see someone, we think, oh, they're so close to God. I can never be that close to God. Um, and we have this kind of negative comparisons with other people. And we imagine that somehow God wants to be close to them, but he doesn't so much want to be close to us. And so we kind of, you know, feel left out sometimes. Part of that, I think, comes from a misconception that some of us had, and I certainly had it myself as a child. Um, I thought that religion and salvation are kind of like a business relationship. I put in into this relationship and I follow through with certain commitments. And then God holds up his end of the bargain with salvation for me. And it's kind of like a business tra transaction. You know, I invest in it and he rewards my investment with salvation. So we each hold to our ends of the contract and we both experience a kind of success. You know, this is a conception a lot of people have, but it doesn't really work for anybody. Many people with this misconception leave God and they leave religion altogether. They say, you know, I tried religion, it didn't work. Others with this misconception stay in religion, but sometimes they end up becoming kind of hard hearted or proud people. Neither one of these is the kind of outcome that that God wants for us. He wants us to be able to be uh, actually close to him. So there's a more accurate conception uh, about this. And the more accurate conception is that God intends a relationship with us. He is looking for that relationship, not some kind of business contract with us. He seeks a friendship with us. He wants us to be his sons and daughters. And he it's a social relationship. And after all, humans are social beings, aren't we? We are intended to be involved with others and close to other people and also close to God. It's God's plan for all of us. You could say it's in our DNA almost. So um, that's, that's a different correction to my misconception that I had when I was uh, much younger. So um, I would like to um, read actually a scripture that I think goes to this point. And I don't have the scripture for the screen, uh, but I will tell you where it is. And if you would like to look at look at it yourself, you may, but I'm going to read it out loud because I think uh, it really it really is to this point. If you want to look for it, it's in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, the first seven verses. It's actually kind of a remarkable passage. Uh, speaking for God, Isaiah is speaking to the Israelites, and he's helping them understand that he doesn't want just this kind of transactional relationship with them. He wants to have an actual uh, friendship. Uh, he wants them, he wants the Israelites to be his sons and daughters and to regard 
him to regard him God as uh, a tender and loving father. So let me read uh, Isaiah 43, one through seven. Do not be afraid for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba for your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You were honored and I love you. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from the east and west. I will say to the north and south, bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. Bring all who claim me as their God for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. So isn't that a really warm picture of God's love for them? And in fact, when Isaiah wrote this, Israel was in captivity in Babylon. And this was God's message of encouragement to them and, and assuring them that he was on their side. In spite of their hardships, he was on their side and he, <clears throat> he would bring them back to their homeland. And he, would be, he was their God and he would continue to be their God. So um, it's really a beautiful text. There are other texts that are really uh, related to this. I just want to go through these texts in order to, to um, make a uh, foundation for um, what we're doing here. So let me see if I can get our next text up. So I just read Isaiah 43, 1 through 7 and the New Living Translation. But look at this text. Um, Leviticus 26, 12. So this is right in the beginning of the Israelite experience. Uh, God says to them, I will be your God and you will be my people. And in 2 Corinthians 6, 18, again, God says, I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And just a couple more texts. In Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. And in 1 John 4, 10, this is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So as we read these, um, I think we can all say that the Bible is clear. God is not seeking some business relationship with us. He's seeking a personal friendship, a relationship of trust and love. And, and I'll say closeness. That's what he's looking for. And he's already initiated this relationship. He has offered us salvation. He's given us Holy Spirit power. He's offered us guidance and wisdom. He's done everything. So here's the question. How can I experience closeness with God? How can I experience closeness with him? And again, I, I know that some people are thinking, you know, um, Rob, he's close to God. Or Pastor, he's close to God. Or this person that I know is real close to God, but I couldn't be close to, God doesn't want to be close to me. But doesn't this scripture say, God wants you to be his friend. He wants you to be close to him. And so it begs the question, can I be close to God? And of course you can be close to God. Let's think about four principles of experiencing closeness with God. So there are four of them. Let's look at the first one that I want to highlight here. How can I be close to God? Number one, stop resisting his love. 
Hmm. Yeah, people sometimes are are not aware that they're actually resisting God and they're resisting his love. Those scriptures we just read, God has initiated everything already. Um, if we're not experiencing closeness with him, it's not because he hasn't tried. He has tried, he continues trying. But I guess I want to ask you, how, how can you stop resisting God's love? I ask myself that. How can I stop resisting his love? You may think it's really um, an amazing admission, but I find myself resisting God's love. It's like I'm saying, um, uh, don't get too close, or um, I'm afraid of what you'll want from me if I let you get too close. It's almost like some human relationships where we don't let a human friend too close to us. Like, let's keep a, keep a nice distance. I want to be friends, but not that kind of friend. And so the question is, how may I stop resisting God's love? Well, um, I can, I can, uh, you know, I, I don't have an easy answer to that, but the very notion that we may be resisting him is worth contemplating. And I, I'll tell you this, that I, that I say to myself sometimes, you know how you talk to yourself? I say to myself, um, don't resist God, be open to him. Let your heart be open to him and let him be, into, be in all parts of you, in all parts of your heart. Don't shut him out. Um, so that's the first principle. So let's go to the second principle. If I'm not going to resist him, then maybe I would be open to listening and talking to God and doing that often. That would be another way to stop resisting is to be open to him, to listen and talk to him. You know, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.17 says in the New Living Translation, never stop praying. <laughs> uh, that's a beautiful text. Uh, the King James says, pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Hmm. So being in, a, in a, an attitude of prayer, in, in a mind of prayer. So how may we listen and talk to God more uh, constantly? Um, and more naturally. Well, um, you know, God is available to us every moment of every day, isn't he? He's ready to be in our lives, and that's why we can never stop praying. But there are Bible examples of people who were always in a prayer mode. As you think of it, remember Nehemiah before the king? He was a cupbearer to the king, and the king asked him a question, and the Bible says, Nehemiah quickly offered a prayer to God for wisdom right in that moment before he answered the king. He was in this kind of constant communion with God. He was living in God's presence. And when the king asked him a question, it was natural for Nehemiah to just uh, pray to God right there in that moment before he even answered. So that's never stopping your prayers. Remember Daniel seeking God every day, even when there was the threat of punishment, if he did so. He would be seen kneeling and praying to God, and that actually got him into political trouble once, as you remember that he was praying in his open window, and his enemies accused him of disloyalty to the king. But he was in the habit of prayer, and he prayed all the time. We get that sense that Daniel was a man of prayer. And we see Peter in the New Testament uh, being directed by the Holy Spirit in a day-to-day -day manner, just in, a, in uh, a prayerful attitude. And in fact, one text says that Peter was in the Spirit, and the Spirit told him to go and meet uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and so this was Peter being in this attitude of prayer all the time. And of course, um, Jesus himself is the most outstanding exemplar 
of never stopping praying. Jesus was in an attitude of prayer. We have to imagine Jesus was in this constant communion with his heavenly father. And so um, that's, you know, more examples of this idea of never stopping praying. We want to let God be our constant, unseen uh, companion. So let's live our lives in this presence of God moment by moment. Let's include him in our thoughts. Let's talk to him all through the day. Maybe not out loud, but at least in our thoughts. And so we will welcome God to be our constant unseen companion. Now think about how people experience closeness to God. So um, we remind ourselves to not resist him. We live in his presence. We're listening and talking to him often. These are ways that we can experience closeness, the kind of closeness that, that actually God is, is inviting and calling us to. But there are more principles for experiencing closeness with God. Let's look at this one. The third one is to be honest with God. Jeremiah 5.3 in the New Living Translation says, Lord, you are searching for honesty. What does it mean to be honest with God? Well, I, I guess I would, uh, I would say to you, there's no point in not being honest with God because he knows your thoughts, right? But sometimes we kind of say to God things in our prayers that are not fully honest, are they? They're like pretty words, they're flowery words, but they're not really um, this full honesty. So what would that honesty look like? And by the way, I'm talking about private prayer here. No one expects any one of us in public prayer to confess our innermost secrets out loud in front of other people. That's really between us and God, isn't it? So I'm talking about in our private prayer time, when we're just living in this attitude of prayer, how can we be honest with God? Well, it would, it would involve this kind of frank, unfiltered conversation with him. No holds, just our private thoughts, humbly presented to God for guidance. And as part of that honesty, it involves confession of our sins and faults. He knows them, but he asks us, he, he, uh, he instructs us to confess our sins to him. It also would involve listening for his voice in scripture and other revelations of his love and will for us. And then we can be honest with him about, about those uh, lessons that we uh, receive from those sources. <clears throat> you know, part of this also would be honest, being honest with ourselves. We will need to, or it will help us if we might ask God to help us see ourselves as we really are with clear vision. You know, sometimes we uh, tell ourselves stories about ourselves that kind of prop up our ego, that, that kind of make us feel better about ourselves. And um, we all do it. Um, but that's maybe not being honest with ourselves or honest with God. And maybe sometimes for us to be honest with ourselves might be too painful. So we, we maybe just kind of shield ourselves from that. But God is actually asking us to be honest with him. So we could go to him. We could open our hearts to him. And we could ask God to help us see ourselves as we really are with this clear vision. And we can compare ourselves to the ultimate criterion the only criterion that really matters, and that's comparing ourselves with Jesus, comparing ourselves with God's standards in the Bible, with his law of love and justice. And that might help us be honest with him. You know, that honesty might be, Lord, when I reflect on you and your life, and your perfect law, I realize I have failed in this area of my life. Maybe it's something I did. Maybe it's something I failed to do. 
Um, maybe it's an attitude I held. Maybe it's a, um, you know, uh, not regarding a brother or sister in the way Jesus would go, would regard them. So this kind of honesty is, is, uh, you know, it's a, it's the opening our hearts and, um, we can be this kind of real person with God. We can tell him what's making us happy. We can tell him why we're sad. Well, what makes us feel discouraged? Um, maybe we feel jealous about something. What's getting under our skin? And we can ask him how to deal with each thing, confessing our sins, praying about the relationships in our lives, the special challenges that we may have, you know, just everything that matters. We can identify the areas in our lives that we can see we need to grow. And we can ask him to help us in those areas, to be our teacher, to be our coach. We can tell him about our aspirations, our shames. We can confess our sins to him and repent them to him. You know, when I look at the uh, Psalms of David, I see a man of God, but a man of God who was honest. Uh, he, we can see David's kind of disappointment. We can see his confession of sin. We can see David's praising of God, but also um, uh, his anger about what he sees around him in the world. He says, why, why, are the, why are the evil successful in their lives? That shouldn't be God. So he's venting his feelings. So maybe, maybe that's something that would be helpful to us in our prayer life, to be honest with God um, in these ways. So if you feel like your relationship with God is stalled, maybe, maybe being more honest with him is a way forward. You know, Luke 11 says, ask and you, you will receive. God is eager to provide us with his Holy Spirit as we ask him. And the Spirit provides us with insight and spiritual power. And the Bible characters didn't just use flowery words and catch phrases or self-congratulations in their prayers to God. Um, there's a centurion in the New Testament who uttered this beautiful prayer. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's honesty. God is honest with us. He shares his heart and love with us as his children. And in spite of his all-powerful status as God, he is open to relationship with us based on this honesty. So again, tell him you feel that things are stagnant with him, if that's, if that's how you feel, and see what he tells you. He might say, hey, I've noticed that too. Let's do something about that. Let's go beyond this stalled relationship. So, that's the third one, being honest with God. Let's go to a fourth one. How can I be close to God? Well, we need to depend on him, of course. And that dependence will grow this closeness. But the dependence that, that we need to have is what I, I don't know a better, I don't know of a better word for it. I'll call it a balanced dependence. And I'm going to, I'm going to, elaborate on this in just a minute. But so how can we have this balanced dependence on God? God definitely invites us to be dependent on him. Um, he, he gave us minds and the ability to think and analyze. And he calls us to partner with him and depend on him and a balanced dependence that uses our minds, but also depends on him in, in all things. So let me just explore this idea of balanced dependence. I have, I have thought these thoughts myself, but I've also encountered others with this next thought, and I'm calling it an, uh, an unbalanced dependence. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If we ask God to make decisions for us and to do things for us as if we are primarily seeking a magic genie who will solve everything for us without our uh, participation. 
a person, a genie who will allow us to avoid the work of thinking and responsibility for our decisions. I guess I've actually encountered some, some fellow believers who I, I generally respect, but to hear them talk, they were, they were asking God to like do a miracle in their life for every little thing uh, and talking to God and asking God to guide them for every little thing. Um, I'll, I will give an exaggeration, but almost like, uh, God, is it time for me to brush my teeth now? Or God, um, should I go to work now? I'm supposed to be there in 20 minutes and it takes me 20 minutes to get, get there. But before I go, I want to ask your permission. Should I go? I don't know. I, I may be giving bad examples, but the, the idea I'm thinking of that I'm trying to show you is that if we approach God in a sense of dependency, where we are asking him to be this kind of magic genie who solves everything for us uh, like magic and allows us to uh, avoid the work of thinking or the work of our life. Um, God wants us to depend on him, but he calls us to be involved in our own lives, to be putting our effort into it. Um, so if I'm going to have a successful career, I definitely want to pray to God about that. I want to ask his blessing and, a, and for his spirit to guide me. But I actually have to go to work. I actually have to put the effort in. I actually have to serve my fellow man and do the responsibility that I was hired to do. And I can't just say, God, um, I'm depending on you. I know you'll take care of everything for me. Just work it all out. And I'm going to sit here and put my feet up. So I would, I'm trying to give you... Uh, uh, an idea of what I'm thinking here as I talk about unbalanced dependence. So let's go to another uh, other extreme, and I'll call this an unbalanced independence. And this it's unbalanced to ask God for his help only when we are in a desperate or crisis situation, and we try to leave him out of our lives the rest of the time. So on the one extreme, we depend on him for every little thing as if he's a magic genie and he'll do it all and we don't have to do anything. But the other kind of extreme to this is this independence where I think, yeah, I believe in God. I'm going to ask for his help, but I'm only going to ask for his help when I'm in some sort of desperate situation or it's a crisis. But the rest of the time, I'm just going to take care of it on my own. It's almost like we are saying, I'll take care of all the regular decisions the day-to-day -day ones, uh, and even the important ones, if I feel I can do it on my own, I'll only seek your help when it's a huge problem to me. It's almost like a uh, thanks for the offer, God, but I've got this. Um, it's a subconscious attempt, I think, to be totally independent of God. Uh, perhaps you remember the Israelites after the Battle of Jericho, they went to the little tiny town of Ai, and they didn't ask for God's guidance in this because they were feeling pretty independent at that point. And it was the kind of attitude of, you know, we're pretty good. We, we just conquered that other town. We can take care of this little one on our own. And you remember, they, they actually failed. They, uh, they were successful in the Battle of Jericho, this larger town. They go to the little village and the people of the AI route them. So this is the other kind of uh, thing we want to avoid is this uh, unhealthy independence. So there's a unhealthy dependence and an unhealthy independence. And what we want to have in our close walk with God is this kind of balanced dependence. So a balanced dependency repeatedly acknowledges our limitations. Can't do it. I'm unable to do this, Lord, on my own. And it also acknowledges God's omnipotence and his omniscience. It submits to his values and instruction. It asks for wisdom and guidance for the sake of his glory. And it stays in this attitude of prayer. It never operates with a sense of entitlement, but also never operates with a sense of leaving God out of our lives and decisions. So, um, we pray and we ask for God's blessings, 
and then we go to we go and do our work, right? So um, so that's the kind of balanced dependency. It avoids the dependency fitball of pitfall of God as a genie in our life. And it also avoids the independency pitfall of God only for a crisis. And it's in that middle area that uh, we can operate in this healthy dependency on God, a balanced dependency. And I hope that all of us can um, see these pitfalls and, and also see where there is this place where we can depend on him without treating him as if he's a genie and also depend on him, not just for the huge problems in our lives, but the day-to-day -day challenges as well. There's that middle place. So how can we be close to God? God calls us to this close experience. Can I experience closeness with God? The Bible says you can. And we've been talking today about some common sense principles of experiencing closeness with God. He wants to be close to you. He initiated whatever relationship we have with him. He initiated it. And by God's grace, we may have been able to respond to it. So what are the four principles that we've been talking about? Well, the first one is stop resisting his love. Stop putting our arms out and saying, God, don't get too close. <laughs> you make me uncomfortable when you get too close. Stop resisting his love. Welcome his love and his presence in our lives. The second principle is to talk and listen to him often. If you're going to have a close friend on earth as a human friend, I think you're going to talk and listen to them often. And the third principle is to be honest with him. The same thing with our earthly friends. We'll be honest with our closest earthly friends, won't we? We certainly want to be honest with God. Open our hearts. Don't keep it back. Don't just try to look good to him. Also, let him see under the rug. Be open to him. Confess your sins. Be frank. And the fourth principle is depend on him. But try to try to try to avoid those pitfalls of the um, God is my genie who does everything and I do nothing in my life. Um, he just magically makes everything happen. Uh, and all I got to do is ask him and I just put my feet up and sit back. And the other pitfall is I actually do everything I can. And only when I'm stuck and it's a huge problem, that's when I depend on him. No, there's a place in the middle where we depend on him for everything, but we we get involved in our own lives, uh, following his guidance and his spirit. So this is our thinking. Can I experience closeness with God? Yes, absolutely. And here are some principles. So we, you can be close to God. I can be close. He invites us and welcomes this closeness. Won't you choose to be open to this kind of experience of closeness with God? I hope you will. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we are overwhelmed with these clear messages in scripture that you want more than a business partnership with us. You want a relationship. You invite us to experience closeness with you. And as we drop our guard and allow you to be close. As we listen and talk to you frequently, day by day, moment by moment, as we are um, honest with you about who we really are with you, and as we depend on you, we believe that you will, you are ready to be close and that we want to experience this closeness and help us to be open to it and have this closeness day by day so that we can be all that you want us to be, so that we can have the joy of living with you in this life and in the life to come. We pray these things as we commit ourselves to you in this quiet moment. Amen.